Hey, um, okay, so back with another small update. I haven't had too much time over the past couple of weeks to uh, work on anything because the semester just started um, and I just got a new job, so trying to get settled into that. But I have worked on a couple of things, so I'll show those off. Um, so I looked at the last video and this was pretty dark, so it's probably hard to see anything, so I apologize about that. Um, so I lightened up the background a bit, but done a little bit of work with this, um, mainly just some more animations that I've been working on. Um, let's see, so this is <clears throat> one of the idle animations. Um, I think OBS is kind of slowing it down a bit, because it does not run this slow, the game. Um, and a bit of an attack animation. And they're all super rough. Uh, the only one that's somewhat polished is that last one. Um, yeah, that's kind of it for that. Uh, and then this, uh, I just kind of want to show off what I was talking about last time with the ability to have a lot of things on the screen interacting with each other. Um, so this is kind of the debug window here. I'm not sure how easy it is to read this. Um, <clears throat> but basically I have, you know, different uh, runtime profiling for all the different systems that are running. So you see uh, collisions and rendering are kind of taking the most right now. Um, transforms aren't taking anything. So, you know, processing um, positions and velocities, things like that. Uh, the AI is not taking any time because it's turned off, so that's a no-brainer. Player controller, it's just one, so it's one guy. But only has to iterate through one uh, entity each each frame, so that's not going to take any time at all either. Um, and this shows the spatial grid, so right now I'm on a 50 by 50 grid for the level. Um, but what's cool, I think anyway, is you know how many dudes I got on here, so... Um, you know, close to 5,000 entities, you know, all interacting with each other. I can run into each of these guys and kind of push them around and they'll push each other around and whatever. Um, and let's, let's see. So over here you have collision checks. Basically I push everything back into a uh, static map. So for each frame it'll do, uh, it basically hashes the entity values. So each entity has an ID, it hashes those. It says, all right, for this frame, have I already checked this guy with this guy? If I have, then I'm not gonna check him again because that's gonna double up on the checks, right? <clears throat> so that's kind of a small optimization that I did. Um, and within this 50 by 50 grid, as you might see, you can see everybody, um, I can get around eight, 9,000 uh, entities just kind of all on this grid. But it's pretty good. Um, I don't ever see myself needing something like that in game, so being able to have that uh, works out pretty well. Um, if I turn these guys on, they'll just kind of. Yep. So you see collisions <clears throat> start to jump up a lot there. Um, so, but again, it's pretty manageable. I mean, they're all. I mean, keep in mind. Um, See if I turn the grid back on. So basically, anything uh, within these areas of the the cells, you know, it's going to do checks. So these checks are going to start jumping up. Um, yeah, it's pretty crazy. So I'll turn them off so they calm down. Start pushing each other back out. Okay. <clears throat> um. Yeah. So. That's one thing I worked on. Let's see. Um, I've also started working on, if I can get into it, this. Okay. So, I think I talked about last time I wanted to do a behavior tree editor. So this is kind of the, the startings of that. <clears throat> Just to give you an idea of what the system is. So all of the behaviors for all the entities are based off of what's called a behavior tree. Um, if you're not familiar with it is, it's really easy to go look it up, just Google behavior tree with AI. Um, basically it's just a, it's a tree of predetermined nodes, predetermined functionality. 
Um, so uh, right here, this is kind of like a test tree for those AI that you saw um, just a second ago. So they start out with uh, a sequence. <clears throat> they get uh, the player's location. Um, and they set their, their view vector or their forward vector, <clears throat> basically which way they're going to turn. They set that to the player. And then they repeat through, um, basically until they get to where I am, right? So they continue to move. Um, and then the last bit of the sequence here is they stop moving, they wait a bit, and then they continue to do it. Uh, there is a fail case in here where if their distance right here, the, the target within range, if this succeeds, then it'll just kick out of everything and just restart it over, right? So basically that keeps them to where if they're next to me, they don't keep trying to walk towards me because it looks clunky. But what's cool about this is that this is all just data, right? It's all data driven. Um, so I don't have to recompile anything. I just edit these scripts and kind of change things as I go along. Now the downside is I can't edit things on the fly. So that's what the editor's for, right? So this is kind of the same way that I do the animations. Um, I could show you some animation scripts real quick. So I have this here. These are all um, editable during runtime. So I go into the animation editor. Um, so here's the you know offsets um, that I was showing the last time. Delays. So I can edit the delays, right? I can just pull it up. <clears throat> so I don't know which one we're looking at. CB. Yeah, why not? I'll edit that one because I don't care about it. So this is a kind of a test animation, just a cube bouncing. <clears throat> or square, not really a cube. Um, but let's say, you know, I was unhappy with the delay between, you know, one and two or something. Uh, so I can come in here uh, and edit the delay, you know, from nine to three or something. or four, who cares, right? So then the system tells me, okay, you've edited something, this is no longer green, so you, you know, save it back out the file. Um, so if we look at the delay, we had 8.999, all that right here. So if I save it back out the file, save it, it edits that, and so now it's at four, right? So again, on the fly, um, kind of uh, editing of data, and then I just go back into, right into the game. I mean, it, it, it reloads that animation, um, whenever I save it back out, it reloads it back into my animation ma um, manager, which is kind of like a map of uh, preloaded animations, and it's good to go in the game. And that's what I want for this. So this system, uh, right now I just have a few nodes that are kind of uh, dropped in right now. <clears throat> Basically, it, uh, if you've ever used um, Unreal Engine, um, what they do, let me blow this up a bit so it, sorry, I'm getting used to actually recording stuff and speaking out loud. Um, anyway, so if you ever used Unreal Engine, they have a, a um, drag and drop kind of node system, right? I'm not sure the terminology to use for it. Um, and it's really convenient and it's used for on the fly editing. So you can stop your game um, or pause your game, go in. I think stop it, yeah. Stop it, go in, <clears throat> in the editor, you know, change some stuff around, and, you know, go right back into the game, not have to restart the editor, not have to really recompile much. Um, they have a, a recompiling on, you know, because of some of the hot loading that they do with their code, but I won't be doing anything like that, at least not for now. Um, but basically the idea with this is, like I said, everything's a tree, right? So um, you have, these are kind of your basic nodes, um, and everything spawns off of those. So you have um, kind of you have composite nodes, which are uh, selectors and sequences for the most part. You also have parallel nodes, which are composite, but I don't have any of those yet. I will doing I will have that functionality eventually. You have composites, um, and then you have uh, decorator nodes, which sit on top of other nodes. And then you have leaf nodes. Now the difference between all of these is basically the amount of children they can have. The decorator typically only has one child. Uh, the composite nodes they can have, except for the parallel node, uh, selector and sequence, they can have multiple children. <clears throat> Pretty much as much as 
you will allow. So I've set a cap right now to be around 10 because I don't necessarily think I'll need more than that for any one particular node. Um, and then the leaf node is not allowed to have any ch children at all, right? It's a task. It's a it's a leaf. If you were looking at a tree, you know, um, yeah. So no children. Um, so there's no functionality for saving anything yet. Um, but basically, what I'm thinking is being able to you know right click or basically have like a root node when you start out a tree, and then you know dragging off some kind of line and letting go. And then, you know, being able to select one of these nodes, it'll pop a new no node down, and it'll be parented. Uh, yeah, it'll be parented to uh, the, the root, right? Or whatever drags it off. So I can do some of that right now. Um, I can parent these, right? So the selector um, can parent the decorator in the sequence, and the decorator is allowed to have a child, so why not? We'll parent him to the leaf, right? So basically, the idea is. Uh, I'll hit save, you know, like this will be a dialog box over here or something like that. Just kind of thinking um, it'd be a good pain to have like a dialog box or some kind of editable values. You know, you, you click on one of these and then its values pop up and you can edit them, whatever. Basically, it'd be like a, a save to file kind of thing, right? So save it out, it'll step through the tree. Um, probably, I'm thinking like a depth first search kind of thing. Like a, a pre-order depth first search, right? I think that's kind of how the way these are looking. Um, to go through, and it'll write all this stuff out for me, right? <clears throat> Do that, and it, it just like the way that the animations are. So save those all out, and then uh, it's good to go. And then you know, if I don't like something, uh, Alt and click on one of the children. I can delete the path. Um, and then move stuff around, right? I'm like, well, I want this to be there and that to be there. Good to go. Um, so that is where I'm headed with that. Uh, I'll be really excited once that gets going, because I think that'll be that'll be cool. So um, I'm gonna kill this real quick. A couple other things I want to show, but they are on different builds. If I kill this real quick. Find it. Mm. This is what happens whenever you have tons of different things you're working on, all these different system tests. All right, so this is another thing that I'm working. So in that same vein of being able to have like base functionality, and then being able to script things around that functionality. Um, kind of writing uh, ad hoc scripting language, kind of. Um, I don't know how efficient it's going to be. This is all just kind of me thinking off the top of my head of, you know, if I had to do that, how would I do it? <clears throat> so what I have right now is base node functionality that I can parent together. Um, and, you know, run through these execute methods on each of the nodes and then pass that data along into other nodes and, and have this chain of functionality, right? So it's like scripting functions on the fly. Um, so I guess the best way to show that off would be to like look at this. So what I'm thinking, and I have some stuff written down here, so I can just copy this. So right now I just have like basic arithmetic arithmetic stuff, right? It's so like multiplication, add, all that. <clears throat> but, but let's say like I have a multiplication node. And each of these nodes, for the most part, they take inputs, right? However many inputs this particular node um, needs to take, and then it has an output, right? So for multiplication, you know, it'll take a couple of nodes. Um, as its input values, multiply those values together and then output, you know, some value. Um, as long as those values that it input has some kind of operator overload, some kind of way to be multiplied together, right? So I, I can't put two strings in there, it doesn't make any sense, right? 
And the good thing about using templates is the compiler will catch that anyway. It's like, this, this doesn't make sense. What are you doing? Um, the floating put values, obviously it works. Doubles work. You know, integers work. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, I could have like some constant here. Um, this could be another, you know, operation. It could be like an addition operation, which takes, you know, like another constant. You know, and then, you know, another constant. Or I could feed in this, you know, into that basically um wh whatever i want to do with it it kind of it's open to have that system working um and then you know this feeds into um, what i call an end right so you have uh, or an exit i think is what i call it right so you have exit points you have entry points um into the nodes so this is actually going to be my entry point um, and then what it does is it'll step through and say, all right, for this, I need this and this value. Cool. So it'll go here first, goes to its, uh, its a child, um, calculates that value. So let's say it's like 4.5 or something, right? Like, cool. So it feeds that into there. So now 4.5 is that. Now it steps into here. I need this. Well, this one, you know, it's, it's recursive, right? So this one says, well, I need this value and I need this value. Then it comes up here. Let's say this is two. And this is, you know, one. So it'll come up here, you grab that one, two, so two will go there. And then it looks at this child, the B child, and says, okay, well, I need this. So it gives it one. Now it can do this operation, right? So it'll add these together. This is three, and pass it here. So now this one has its B child. Multiply these two together, um, which is, well, oh God. Oh god, multiplication on top of my head? Are you kidding me? People are making fun of me right now. 14. Don't make fun of me. That's on the fly. So so basically the the output value of this turns out to be 14, right? And so I, I have all these different scripting abilities working. Um <clears throat> so here's uh here's a couple of them, right? So I got a multiply node. Uh, a subtraction node. This is a cast to integer node, so I can take one of those floats and, and cast them. Um, division, addition, and then here's our, here's some of the constants, right? So an E float. All these different con constants. And basically what you do is you go through and you set inputs, right? So this is the A input. Here's the B input. Um, for the addition, I'm setting the inputs. So subtraction um, is like the subtraction's output value is the A input for that, and then the divisions output. I'm setting all these, and then all I do is, I've said, you know, uh, this is the entry point, right? <clears throat> so I have the entry point, and it just has to execute the entry point, and then it runs that entire function, right? Um, which, if I actually run that, give it a second. I'm not sure. Multi-threaded compilation is going to kill OBS, so I apologize if it does. But after it, it gets through and calculates everything, you get 5.34. Um, which, if you don't believe me, pause it, go through and do these operations real quick, and you'll see that that's what you get, right? Um, so that's actually pretty cool. So I was thinking maybe, you know, in the same vein of the behavior tree editor that I have set up, being able to do something like that as well. So on the fly, scripting functionality using... Um, drag and drop node editor, you know, which, you know, U, uh, UE4 uses something similar to that, but I think they use C sharp as their scripting and they do it in a very much more elegant way than what I'm thinking. Um, but again, this off the top of my head and this was like a day of just thinking about it and writing some stuff out. So I might go with that. I might not, depending on how efficient it is. You know, maybe I'll talk to some guys at work and they'll yell at me and call me stupid. So. Um, and then the last thing, I think the last thing, yeah, yeah, the last thing is this last build here. Okay, build this. Um, so as soon as this loads up, this will look kind of similar to the other build, right? But there's some small differences. Uh, one being that there's some rotation going on with the player, right? Um, 
And the reason for that is I've completely rewritten the camera system. So originally, the entire game I was thinking was going to be um, completely orthographic, and then I would have to do, and I was doing this, doing uh, transformations from what's called you know Cartesian space into isometric space, right? And so if you're not sure what that is, basically. Um, get rid of this. There we go. So Cartesian being right like you know normal cardinal axis, right? Or cardinal, sorry, cardinal axis. So you know. Um, y and x, right? So this would be Cartesian space. You know, your typical graphs that you're kind of used to in algebra and whatever. <clears throat> now isometric space is, uh, depending on which angles you use, um, mine used 30 degree and 45 degree rotation. Basically, you just flip this, rotate it 45 degrees, and then you squash the, the y-axis, the, the now y-axis, right? If you keep it pointing up, you squash it down by half, right? And I actually have an action set up, so I can show you what that looks like. So there you go. So now that's that's isometric, um, which actually if I go back, copy that, there. So now you have um, this one being Cartesian. All right, shut up. So you have this one being Cartesian, this one being isometric. So you can kind of see the differences in between them. So what you, what you know what you have to do is do all of the collision calculation in here because it's easy and then when you render things out you transform it into here so that it looks you know the way you want to do it um of course there are small small things to consider right it's a it was you know 2.5d instead of actual 3d <clears throat> so there's no z axis in here right now there is kind of a z axis here right or at least you can kind of fake it so what I was doing is um, you have a height value for all the transforms for all the entities and you add that on to the y value and then you get height right so anytime that I was going through and saying you know all right so for its position you know add its uh, its height and add its velocity and all it did is when it rendered it out you know if he was here say, then if he has like some height then it just pushes him up on his y value, right? So instead of you know the guy being right here, <clears throat> now he has a, a base height of being up here. So now he's kind of floating, right? Basic, but then whenever you did any calculations, like if I wanted to do some like ground collision checks against this guy with this guy, I would have to retransform him down back to the ground and then check to see whether or not their uh, their ground positions collided. Okay, and that works, um, and I got it working pretty efficiently. But with this other way, doing this, oh, okay, <laughs> the limiter stopped working. Awesome, getting like a million frames a second. Um, so with this, oh, I know what the problem is. I don't have VSync on, so this is kind of a cheat. I haven't implemented VSync into uh, here yet. So let me stop it and restart it. But the um, the benefit of something like this is again, I can have actual 3D objects in the game, but uh, their textures could be you know hand drawn, so they can look they look hand drawn, right? Um, and See, what was the other about it? Uh, depth sorting is super easy, right? I actually have depth to the camera now. So what I was doing before is I had to manually set all the depths of these things based off of their, their Y distances. But now, I mean, I don't have to do any of that. This is, you know, the camera's taking care of the depth sorting. Um, height is really easy because it's just the Y value on this plane because um, this is an actual, it's an actual 3D camera. Um, it'll make lighting calculations a lot easier. I won't have to fudge anything in the shaders like I was doing before. Like I was having to, to transpose uh, the the matrix for the the world position, right? So Y became Z, and that screwed up the ordering with a lot of stuff. Don't have to do that. Uh, and also for like editing 
different things. Um, I have actual 3D now, so being able to go through and you know, kind of look at see what the world actually looks like in certain spots, uh, it'd be a lot easier to uh, put things together. Um, I think and it's just cool. It's just cool. So yeah, um, yeah. The, the main thing is being able to. Yeah, I can switch back and forth between isometric and and uh, perspective. So it's basically when you switch when I switch back to isometric, um, I just lock the camera, right? So like, that's those rotations that I was talking about, um, which are actually over there in the debug window over here. Um, they're meaningless, pretty much. Um, but yeah, so yeah, um, that's kind of what I've been working on what I'm going towards, so I don't think I have much else to talk about, but um, yeah, so thanks for watching. All right.